This is the Infotagen podcast, the vaccine to the disinformation virus. People You May Know is a new documentary available on Amazon Prime, featuring Charles Creel, our regular disinformation analyst on this podcast, and his partner, Katerina gellin Viken. The film follows them on a journey of discovery from Westminster to the deep south of the United States, investigating an intriguing but overlooked area of the work of Cambridge Analytica. In People You May Know, we see how data gathered by American churches has been used to target vulnerable people and radicalise their political beliefs. As we approach the presidential election in November, Creel gathers a team of whistleblowers and journalists who help him discover a powerful organisation with ties to the heart of the White House that appears to be at the centre of it all. I'm Damien Collins, and for this podcast, we'll be joined by Charles and Kat to discuss their new film. Before we start the discussion, perhaps you could explain where you are, because I know you were he- planning to head back to America for the election. Right. We, well, thanks. And it's it's good to be here in a different role on the podcast. And um, right now we're in uh, uh, Fairhope, Alabama. So Fairhope, Alabama is down on the Alabama Gulf Coast. Uh, it's part of where we shot uh, the film People You May Know. It's also my family home. Um, so uh, it's good to come back here. But particularly... We're here because we're concerned uh, about the coming election, uh, the U.S. presidential election, but also the local elections and the state elections. And we've come to observe and record. Um, and we have, we'll have a lot to tell you on Infotagen about it. Yeah, absolutely. I would be really looking forward to uh, talking to you uh, on the podcast uh, over the next few weeks as uh, the election unfolds and the period after it. And uh, how long are you staying out there for? Uh, we're here for a couple of months. Um, then um, at the end of December, we'll be heading back Europe way. Okay, well, that's good. And uh, and what's the weather been like? Um, well, the weather's been a massive hurricane. It hit two days before we arrived. Um, so we arrived to uh, no power across the city. Um, there are trees down everywhere. If you hear some buzz saws and back them up trucks in the background, that's because they're still trying to clear the city. And does, this, does that sort of hurricane, do people take it in their strides or does it really uh, cause, cause chaos? Comes every year just like Halloween and Christmas. Okay. <laughs> now, we, um, we're talking today about uh, People You May Know, your exciting uh, film, which has just been released. Um, and I have watched it and I was fascinated by it. It covers some issues I was very familiar with from the work we did on the Select Committee. But it also, I think, provides a, a new insight into areas of work that Cambridge Analytica were involved in, which I don't think have really been covered in any depth before. Perhaps you could tell us how how you got into that. Absolutely. Well, really, that started with me um, beginning to advise the committee. Um, The way that I became advisor of the committee is uh, right about the time that uh, Trump won office, I, as many other people, were shocked by it. And I became obsessed with this Cambridge Analytica story. Um, I read the article that Vice put out, which was a translation of an article uh, that had been published in Austria. Uh, They talked to Brad Parscall at the time, who, by the way, at that time was already admitting that they were suppressing votes based on uh, racial profiling, um, and started writing articles about it. And those articles turned into evidence for the committee, and I came in and advised Joel. When we got to the end of the uh, committee process, the DCMS Select Committee on Disinformation, um, I felt like I wanted to go further with the investigation. And so we started looking into um, what was happening on the American side. Uh, Chris Vickery came in to give evidence to the committee. And when he did, he started talking about um, evangelical churches and, and the idea that there might be a database of evangelical voters. And so we followed that line and uh, really found out kind of what Cambridge Analytica did next, but also ultimately came to realize, no, this is what Cambridge Analytica has been doing all along. Uh, that the idea that um, the the fundamental idea is that Cambridge Analytica uh, worked with um, a software company in America called Glue, commissioned by a Koch brothers charity, in order to build a giant platform 
um, with the database on all American voters where they could identify people who are mentally and emotionally ill and then target them um, in order to monetize them for the church, but then also to weaponize them for the politics of the right. And with, now, the I know in the film you refer to uh, what we call during the inquiry the database of truth, the database that Chris Vickery discovered. Is is this data, was some of this in the database of truth, or is this more data that uh, you discovered as part of the, your investigations? Uh, part of it's the database of truth. I mean, really what we come to find out is that the database of truth is practically a parallel to, it's, it's a parallel between the Republican National Committee database the United in Purpose database, which is uh, a Christian charity, and um, all of the, there's there's a real circulation of data between these databases, and it's it becomes fundamentally Cambridge Analytica's database as well um, when they're dealing with whatever clients they might be dealing with. Yeah, absolutely. So once once they've got the data, they can use it for for what they like. So so the, so the database that you that you focused on in the film that's a combination of. Uh, church records gathered by evangelical churches in America that overlaid with um, the sort of some of the sort of psychological profiling work we're familiar with Cambridge Analytica and then overlaid again with political data. Is that, is that right? That's exactly right. So it's a combination of, uh, if you've seen the Channel 4 documentary as well that's out right now, it's their publicly available records, which they talk about. This includes, now includes the, the church records. It will include... Um, state, Republican, uh, and Democratic um, voting databases, and all of this is put together, and it's run through um, Cambridge Analytica's standard psychological profiling. What's interesting about what is added here with glue and the churches is now suddenly they're profiling people for things um, like mental illness. They're profiling people for ADHD, they're profiling people for bipolar, they're profiling people for addiction, opioid dependence, they're profiling for people who are under pressure from financially or headed for divorce. And this makes them really emotionally vulnerable. Um, and once you identify people who are emotionally vulnerable, the idea of the platform is you can begin to recruit them into church-based recovery and support programs. Um, once they're in those recovery and support programs, um, they can then be bought, brought closer in. And what's the, I mean, what's the, for the churches, is it, is this about fundraising or is it, or is it, you know, literally an evangelical crusade to, to spread their, their networks as far as they can? I think it depends on the church that you're uh, dealing with. So I think there are some small operators who just see an opportunity to, um, expand their church and to serve people better. Um, and then you have bigger mega churches who are wanting to plant new churches. Um, so they view this as an opportunity to geolocate regions where people are suffering, um, particularly from, say, opioid dependence or financial distress, and they can plant a church in the middle of that. Or you have really big operations like Hillsong, um, who are international in their base, uh, they, they massive amounts of money flow through them and politics becomes a fundamental part of what they do. Well, of course, also it's not black and white and hi, Damien, it's nice to be on the invitation. <laughs> Great to have you on. Uh, uh, it's, um, it's not black and white. I mean, you have small village churches who genuinely want to help people. And uh, of course, as you say, they are evangelizing and it says in the Bible that you should. Um, but it becomes something much more sinister when you see background documentation that this platform is built for the purposes of politics and it's built to be able to flip swing states and key voters in key areas and that marriage is related to how you vote and marriage and uh, church attendance is related to being Republican or Democrat. So uh, churchgoers are quite overwhelmingly Republican. So if church attendance decreases, then so so also does the vote. So they're very aware of that. And and uh, but what the donors of this platform might want might be very different to what a village preacher might want. And you will see that in our film. Um, and some of the preachers we spoke to are completely unaware of this kind of operation. They, they just want to help their flock through grief or financial stress or relationship problems. And then, then there's a there's a kind of another group of people here where um, 
they want to help their people and they're doing good works, but at the same time, they're very quickly adopting behavioral design mechanisms. Well, you can also see that churches now are, um, you know, traditionally they've been uh, quite conservative in their use of digital platforms, but now, at least in the States, they the digital platforms can run the entire church. So you can, you can watch people... Um, sign in, they can sign their child in, they can sign, um, everything is digitized. They can track their entire congregation, they can track donations. And I think people are very unaware of when you sign into your church, what kind of data you're then giving them and, and, and where that data might go. Absolutely. I mean, as, as, as people are, I think with most, most things they sign into, but probably wouldn't ever suspect that that could be the case at their, their church. I mean, you, you touched on this in the film that, that some of the people that have taken an interest in this and invested heavily in it are not the sort of people that come from the the church community do you think they recognize the potential power of the sort of data that churches could collect and wanted to get their hands on that for other reasons for sure i think that there are there are other bigger motivations at hand here and 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 certainly some of the funders here are less interested in religion and much more interested in politics i'd say I think, um, and I think I thought I think that's one of the things that makes the film so interesting because a lot of the analysis of the work of companies like Cambridge Analytica has been in the sort of purely political sphere and looking at data targeting around elections and um, and the power of that. But I think this gives us a really interesting insight into the sorts of places where they can acquire large amounts of data. And I think the film certainly suggests the, the very close relationship that exists between these organisations that are gathering this data and creating networks of churches uh, and, and their data and uh, Donald Trump's campaign. I think, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, it's interesting about glue because, and, and glue is the um, other, uh, is the partner with Cambridge Analytica under the commission from the Koch brothers charity here. Um, and they're the, the software partner. Um, so Cambridge Analytica working with glue gathered all this data, but as we, began looking through this, uh, the farther we got into it, the more we realized that Glue is actually um, not a tack-on company late in the life of Cambridge Analytica. They're kind of foundational to the whole thing. So while companies like Cambridge Analytica got caught up in our investigations, say in the committee, um, and Aggregate IQ got caught up in that, uh, Glue is just one that, uh, that escaped. Um, they're one that got away. And uh, the committees that are investigating these things around the world are not necessarily um, set up to conduct criminal investigation. They don't have the resources, uh, nor do they necessarily have the legal framework uh, to do this kind of thing. And I think it's it's why it becomes all the more important that we see things like uh, the ICO Cambridge Analytica report come out. They've had access to a great deal of data and the servers, and we'll know about all of these subcontractors who've been there from the start. Exactly. And I think that's, that's I think what we're all hoping to see from uh, Elizabeth Denham and the, uh, and the ICO is a, is a, a kind of detailed explanation of what Cambridge Analytica were doing, how it worked. Um, but I, I, sometimes I, I, when I think of Cambridge Analytica and Alexander Nix in particular, I'm reminded of um, Richard Pryor's character in Superman 3, you know, which I think for people who aren't familiar with the movie, although I can't believe there's anyone listening that isn't, um, he works for a company and finds out a way of harvesting fractions of cents from people's pay and keeping all the money for himself. But rather than just doing that discreetly, he, he's very ostentatious in the way he spends that money and draws attention to himself. And I sort of wonder whether Cambridge Analytica, whether they, you know, flush with the success of their work on the Trump campaign and other campaigns, uh, they couldn't help but sort of talk at what they did. And as a consequence, they became the focus of a lot of uh, investigations. But there are probably other companies doing similar stuff who no one's ever heard of. Well, it's it, we have good examples in the film. I mean, some of these people we spoke to can't resist touting their product. And it is a product. And, and one of the founders of, of one of the charities talks to us in the film about, you know, he, he sees people suffering as opportunities um, and uh, they diagnose opportunities around the church. 
and it, when you start looking at it that way, it becomes very cynical. Um, when whether it's passionate about ministry or whether it's passionate about something else becomes hard to tell. But I, I, th I think it's certainly, um, you know, wh when when you started the committee, Damien, it, it, we have to all remember how, what a short time it's been since we weren't aware of these issues at all, and and it's been such a quick journey from here to there. And in the meantime, people have capitalized on it hugely uh, behind closed doors. And, you, you know, psycho's going to psycho. People can't help but go out <laughs> and and um, big themselves up. And we've seen that with Nix. We've seen that uh, with Parscale. Uh, however unfortunate the last 24 hours have been for him. Um, Parscale has been living large in D.C., and as I said before, right from the beginning, was saying in um, his initial um, news interviews and articles that yes, we're we're harvesting data. Yes, we're profiling people, and yes, uh, we're targeting uh, them to suppress vote off the basis of of race and religion. Absolutely, and it's I mean, and as you say, it wasn't that long ago that we didn't know any of this at all. Uh, and I think when we started the inquiry, when we, when we first met, I think we'd, um, you referred to this in the, in the film, the, you'd written a paper for NATO on Cambridge Analytica. And that was one of the first things I'd seen which really started to ask some questions about it. When you gave evidence to the committee, you, you were able to discuss um, some of the issues around the, the concerns the Guardian had flagged about uh, Cambridge Analytica, perhaps you know, acquiring Facebook user data. And it's, it's amazing, that's, that story now, that Guardian article is referred to all the time and by people that are interested in these issues and follow them closely. But it wasn't something that really was very well known at all outside of the, the tech community. It was quite a specialist thing, uh, but yet was such an important flag to raise. So I remember when you came and gave evidence to the committee to talk about these things, I said to the clerk at the end of it, we need to hire this guy um, to, to help prepare <laughs> us for the evidence sessions with Facebook. And then we had that brilliant session where you joined us in America, where we've been in New York, you joined us at Penn Station and then briefed the committee on the train to Washington um, the day before the hearing. So um, it was a great introduction into some of these issues and you helped steer us onto the, onto the right path. But do you feel now, I mean, looking back at the inquiry and the work since, that if anything has been achieved, it's at least been making people more aware of, of the questions they should be asking, people, making people more suspicious about how data is used and where it comes from and, and the companies that are involved in that trade? I, I do think that's absolutely right. Uh, sunlight is the best disinfectant, as we all know, and the more that people are aware of what's going on, um, the the more they can protect themselves from it. I mean, we, as we say almost every week, we need legislation uh, to, to deal with a lot of these issues, but we also just need awareness and, and people need resilience uh, in, in the social media sphere, and they need to understand that they're being targeted, they need to understand disinformation. Um, so that, on the positive side, I think is is the outcome is that there is a global conversation about these issues where there wasn't one before. Yeah, um, that's the beginning. And then certainly the the committee was such a, a huge part of that. As a filmmaker, it was a strange journey to watch um, the beginnings of that and start following Charles uh, uh, coming and advising you all and and. I wonder if people across the globe are aware that that this committee really was the first to wade into this territory, and uh, and it it should be shouted about because it was a, a very important first step. And I think we provided a, an opportunity for people all around the world to plug into the investigation. I mean, people like like Chris Vickery and uh, and Charles, you betrayed our trade secret about using WhatsApp to uh, brief people during the live hearing. <laughs> Um, I'm I'm hoping that they've stopped doing that now. <laughs> yeah, but it was a bit of we would have people. I mean, pe people on the west coast uh, getting up uh, in the middle of the night to watch the hearings and respond and send things in in real time, which was amazingly helpful for us. But I think showed um, how important it was to them that these questions were asked. Um, there's something you discussed in the film with Chris Vickery that I, I think is really important, is because I think sometimes when people talk about micro targeting and how that's done. It's done in the con it, people interpret it from a personal point of view. So, what I can be targeted with, what my data can be used for. But in some ways, what's more important is the the context for that. It's the way, as you, uh, I think, it's such a great title for the film. It's the way you can group people together with other similar people, some of whom they know, some of whom they don't know, and then the power of targeting groups rather than just targeting individuals. 
Yes, that's absolutely right. And we see this with, uh, with uh, lookalike profiles as well, that um, uh, it, there's something really powerful there. Um, if you can target and motivate groups and, and, and get them to um, move or, in fact, get them to not move at all. Well, and, and it translates into the physical sphere as well, again, from the film where you hear um, these church organizations, once you have reached out to people who might be persuadable to come to church, you get them into church and you get them in a small group. And that small group um, will then give them a robust sense of self and community. And if your robust community are all voting one way or all believing in one certain way, it become, and particularly if you're vulnerable, it becomes almost impossible to resist. You just become part of that movement. But these issues of, of community, of vulnerability, of inviting people in, um, the first time I dealt with these themes was in doing a lot of counter-radicalization work, which is what I used to do. Um, I used to go out and do a lot of work in frontline states in Iraq and Northern Asia and so on, um, working on counter-radicalization. And we were dealing with exactly, exactly the same issues, the same territory, the same kind of targeting that was happening. Well, and on a much smaller level, just uh, personally, I've lost both my parents at a young age. And, and I, I just imagined seeing these church programs that were rolled out. If somebody targets me with a message about grief that I might want to come in and not feel lonely and feel like I have a community around me, that's extremely powerful. It's very, yeah. Absolutely. What do you mean, Charles, I'm off, Charles and Catherine, after all you've been through on this, on this project um, and what you've seen from the committee work and your experience of that, I mean, how do you think this all started? What do you think the sequencing of this? I and mean, we focus quite a lot on Steve Bannon and Cambridge Analytica and the project that work they did um, for the 2014 midterms in America, which seemed to be a kind of a trial run for some of this technology. Do you think people developed the technology and then went out to go and find data to add to it? Or do you think it evolved in a more organic way? Well, I would say it's probably organic. I mean, the, the interesting thing at the beginning of uh, the film, if you'll notice, uh, one of the data guys from Glue actually quotes the Bible. He quotes Nehemiah, and he talked to me a lot about biblical precedent for data. And that really, even with censuses in the Bible, they, they were taking the pulse of the people and measuring how they were doing all the way, all the way back then. And he was likening it to what they're doing now. So I think it's a very organic involvement of data we've always gathered in various ways. And then, you know, with, with the tech industry being what it is, people have jumped on exploiting that because there's no legislation and there's no rules around it. So quietly, what commercial companies started seeing as opportunities, now other companies and other institutions are now also seeing as huge opportunities. And it's it has just grown that way. There's a darker side to this um, that I look at in terms of the way that it's all begun, uh, Damien. And that's that a lot of these, if not all of these, influence companies have grown out of government contracting um, for uh, national security and international operations for governments. Uh, and when I look at Cambridge Analytica, what I see is a parent company, SCL, who were doing lots of contracts for the US and the UK. Um, and in a lot of cases, this is very positive work in the interest of the civil society. Um, but it's also work that's not necessarily transparent. And that you add NICs into that mix and suddenly you had Cambridge Analytica and uh, I wouldn't say chickens coming home to roost, but what, you did, what we did see is we saw all of this technology and all of this knowledge about um, behavioral science being turned on our own countries, um, in our own elections. And that's not comfortable. Um, Absolutely not. I mean, you, I mean, Sven Hughes, former SCL employee, now with his own own business, um, is featured quite a lot in, the, in your film, and I think he makes the point that if you are unscrupulous, there's a lot of money to be made and a lot you can do with this information and data. Well, absolutely. You know, there are there are island nations to be owned, um, and there, but there are in fact. Um, as as Baiba Braja would say, um, we're all frontline countries now. 
And now we had a great chat uh, not long ago with um, Antonio Garcia Martinez talking about his time at Facebook and he worked on the development of uh, some of the some of the really key Facebook uh, ad tools, um, and he made uh, and he made a sort of a, a, the case that we've heard many times before, which is that um, although he's very critical of the, the way the tools work and the way some of them work and the way uh, Facebook is developed, he still has the view that this is not. Um, you know, does it really work? He's not he's always convinced that it doesn't really work in the way people think it does. I mean, looking at what you've been through in the making of this film and your work with the committee and your other work in, the, in this space, I, I know you sounded pretty skeptical about that on the podcast, but I mean, how powerful a tool do you think this really is? Oh, it's an unbelievably powerful tool. Um, whenever people are out touting this, uh, touting this technology, um, they're talking about how well it works and how it can move populations and move individuals and so on. And then whenever they're in front of a select committee being investigated, the technology actually doesn't work. Um, and we've seen this over and over again um, at the committee. Um, I think what what they're, what they're being um, uh, not completely uh, transparent about is that this technology doesn't work very well if you're talking about people in the middle. If you want to take someone who's a Republican and turn them into a Democrat, that's not going to happen, um, and vice versa. And it has uh, limited effectiveness on people who are undecided. However, if you have people who are out at the margins, um, then it's very effective in turning them into evangelists. Um, so if you have someone on on the who has far right tendencies and you want to push them out into serious action, um, that's a thing that's pretty easily done. And if you and if you have someone who's on the far left, it's pretty easily done. And that makes me uncomfortable as well because now we're talking about the techniques of an Islamic state or a group of neo-Nazis who are looking for people who are emotionally vulnerable, who are out on the edges, who can be pushed into action that might ultimately lead to violence. Well, also look at look at the numbers. Look at deterring democracy. The Channel Four doc out yesterday, along with ours, and they have the numbers on suppressing the black vote and taking voters who were undecided or apathetic and making sure they stayed at home. Uh, JP DeGans, who we interviewed for the film, who as uh, part of this Koch brothers charity talks about marriage uh, and uh, divorce rates declining in Jacksonville, Florida, which was their testing ground for uh, the, the Insights micro-targeting platform, I think 17%, he says. And, you know, this, this data is hard to verify, perhaps, but, but these we're starting to get numbers on the fact that it's working. Peter Palmer talks about how history happened in Russia and Ukraine first. Um, all of this voter suppression and voter operations in America happened in Jacksonville, Florida first. It's been a real uh, petri dish, and I mean, looking ahead, I mean, we, we I look forward to us talking about this in the coming weeks. But looking ahead to the U.S. election, I mean, if the election result is disputed, then that could be the most dangerous and fascinating period of all um, in the weeks after polling day. Oh goodness, yes. <laughs> it's it's a, it's a very uncomfortable time. Um, as an American, I sit uncomfortably with it. I don't want to watch what I I fear is is coming next here. Um, I don't see in the polling that anybody is going to um, win by a landslide. Uh, so, and and then you had into the mix the the tricky problem of the Supreme Court, uh, which will see play itself out over the next week. Um, I am worried about um, violence around this election. Um, I'm worried about it coming from the right because that's that's a very gun happy culture. I'm worried about it coming from the left by people who feel like they will have been disenfranchised. In fact, both sides will feel disenfranchised, I think, no matter what happens. It's a, it's a, a tricky moment for democracy in the United States, and um, I hope it goes the right way. And ammunition sales are up 139%, according to the NRA. Yes. <laughs> that is one, one of my friends down here, who's already got 2,000 rounds of ammo at his house, was saying, I don't think I got enough, but I just can't find any anymore. 
Yeah, that is frightening. That's frightening. So, I mean, uh, Cats and Charles, I mean, as, as now you've got this um, fantastic project uh, out to, it's out in the world. Um, what, uh, what are you going to be working on, on next? Well, we've been thinking about making a documentary about puppies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and kittens, yes. <laughs> Well, uh, on a serious note, we, you know, it's 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 hard once you start down this path to to go into the non-serious space. We we have been looking at a uh, potential series on on conspiracy theories because uh, they seem to be blooming in all the wrong places and uh, uh, equally dangerous to a democracy and pandemic response as we've seen. So um, we're we're looking into that. And there's some pretty unique things going on around um, Q. Um, and we think we've found an angle that really hasn't been covered, so we may be having a look at that too. There's also a lot of evidence that uh, keeps keeps on coming in, um, and I think it may well change the direction we go, uh, depending on what we see. I mean, Q is is fascinating because it, if we look back at the you know the work you covered in the film and the work we covered on the committee, and the issues that are around the, the 2016 election. In some ways, that is, um, it looks like a sort of a, a more simple and wholesome time where we, you know, you're then worried about a bit of foreign interference and, um, you know, and, and voter suppression, both, both pretty serious issues. But, um, but with Q, we're really looking at some people creating a movement out of total fantasy and conspiracy uh, based on the most outrageous lies, but nevertheless creating a movement of people that are advocates of it. Yes, and and uh, and creating merchandise and and creating a yes a whole movement as you say it's um, it's a very dangerous space to be in and it, it gets promoted on channels um, that could be seen as very trustworthy otherwise so channels around wellness and channels around you know suburban moms or fitness coaches or and and seemingly quite wholesome people promoting utter and complete nonsense. Uh, and it, it's a it's a very interesting space to look into, and I think will become um, very important. I often say that you should follow the money on these things, and you know there is a money path around Q that leads to the owner of Eight Chan. Um, but I think that what has happened now is so many people are taking advantage of it. There are too many paths uh, of monetization to to actually use something as simple as follow the money to analyze it. Mm -hmm. Now, before we before we finish, we've got listeners to the podcast in every continent of the world. I think, apart from Antarctica, um, as far as I'm aware, um, where can people uh, watch people you might know, depending on where they are? So, in the US, it's on Sundance Now, which is an Amazon subscription channel. In the UK, it's a uh, Doc Club, Amazon Doc Club, I think. Uh, in the again, US, it's also on Fusion. On Fusion, um, which is the Latin American channel. And uh, it's it's on uh, other channels across the globe. Globosat in Brazil, Rialto in New Zealand uh, is premiering shortly. History in France, ZDF in Germany, ZDF and in Germany. NRK in Norway and Scandinavia. Yeah, um, off off the top of my head, I can't remember the rest, but it's uh, but it, it's it should be easily accessible almost everywhere. So. And 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 I th I think it I think I saw today that it's been torrented already. <laughs> <so. laughs> yes, of course. Brilliant. Well, Kat, it's fantastic to have the chance to talk to you on the podcast today. And uh, Charles, it's great to talk with you as always. And congratulations on the release of the film. Thanks a lot, Thank Damien. Thank you, Damien. You've been listening to the Infotagion podcast, hosted by me, Damien Collins, featuring Katerina gelling Vikin and Charles Creel. It was produced by Lucy and David Dagahu. You can find out more about Infotagion, the independent COVID-19 fact-checking service recommended by Ofcom and send us examples of disinformation you've seen by visiting our website, infotagion.com, or using hashtag IsolateTheLines on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you. Until next time.